will be a day to remember for the rest of your life. The Pro Football Hall of Fame is excited to present the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Networks. With over 100 Hall of Famers participating, we have reached 47 states and countries all over the world sharing the message that football is more than a game and can teach Americans important life values like commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and excellence. But you have to make right decisions even when nobody's watching you. Well, respect is not just given out. It's not handed out like a, like a, like a brochure. It's earned. Today, you are presented with an opportunity to meet and learn from one of the greatest football players of all time. But more important than that, the chance to see that their Hall of Fame life wasn't given to them. They didn't roll out the bed great. They put the work in, on the field, in the weight room, in the classroom, in their communities. They made themselves a Hall of Famer on and off the field. Your feet can't take you where your mind's never been. Because you can make it, but it's just going to take a little hard work, and some effort, and the drive and determination. And today, you will learn you can do the same thing they did. You don't have to have a gold jacket or a bronze bus to make a difference in the lives of others. It's your decision whether you want to be a successful student, son, daughter, brother or sister. If attitudes are contagious, is your attitude worth catching? It's integrity as well because when you decide to pursue something and you don't quit, that says a lot about you. Commitment to excellence. We can all aspire to be the best. Welcome to a once in a lifetime program, the heart of a Hall of Famer program connected by Extreme Network. The great hands and even greater speed of wide receiver James Lofton made him one of the premier deep threat receivers of his era. Lofton played for five teams in his NFL career. He joined the Buffalo Bills in 1989, and in 1991, he became the oldest player in the history of the NFL to have over a thousand yards receiving in a season. When his career ended, James Lofton had scored 75 touchdowns, caught 764 passes, and owned one of the most prestigious records in the NFL. He retired with the most yards receiving in the history of the league, 14,004. Uh, for our latest installment of the Heart of a Hall of Famer series, today featuring our Hall of Famer, Mr. James Lofton. My name is Jake Ray. I'm the Youth and Education Manager at the Pro Football Hall of Fame down there in Canton, Ohio, uh, and I'm going to be moderating our session today. Our mission at the Pro Football Hall of Fame is to honor the heroes of the game, to preserve its history, to promote its values, and to celebrate excellence together. The values we promote are those of commitment, integrity, courage, respect, honesty that not only was a reason why Mr. Lawson has that gold jacket on today, but it's what made him a great football player. It's what made him a great individual, great father, son, a member of his community, and truly can make you students who are here today and everybody we have tuned in watching the best student that you can be. So I'm excited today, and hopefully all you are as well, uh, to hear how these values impacted Mr. Lawson's career both on and off the field. And hopefully, you guys can leave today with a little bit of that knowledge to impact your own lives. Before we do get started and we do officially introduce our special guest today, I'd like to put out some few, a few thank yous. First off, thank you to Extreme Networks, the sponsor of this event, for everything they do for us here at the, our, at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. We wouldn't be able to be here today. You wouldn't get have the opportunity to hear from a Hall of Fame football player if it wasn't for them. So thank you to Extreme Networks so much for all that you do for us at the Hall of Fame schools across the country and, and truly everybody that you impact. Secondly, I'd like to thank teachers, administrators, staff, anybody that's participating in the program today, especially those staff here at Lombardi Middle School for welcoming us uh, for the program today and everything that they did to help us set up for the program. 
And then lastly, I have to thank our students today. You know, this program doesn't go without you guys. You guys are going to get the opportunity to ask a question today, not only here in person, but you guys are going to be able to see schools from all over the country ask questions to Mr. Lofton today. So you guys are going to see people you may never have gotten the chance to see, uh, not only here, but all over the country as well. How today will go is we're going to bring our special guest out here in a second. Um, but once we do, we're going to go kind of round robin to our schools to ask questions. We're going to start right here in Green Bay with our students. And then we're going to kind of go through all of our, excuse me, all of our schools who are remotely connected in. Uh, so when I say, all right, we're going to go to school A, I'm going to have the students step up to the microphone, state their name, the grade they're in, and then go ahead and ask their question. So I'm super excited today. And I would like to welcome our special guest today, Hall of Famer, Mr. James Lofton. Thank you, thank you. So my microphone and headset are on. And, and I do have a question for somebody in the audience. And every morning I think, am I gonna learn anything today? So when I was pulling up to the school, when I was here, I lived in Ashwabana. And so this school was here, I think it was a high school at the time. And when I drove up to it today, Vincent T. Lombardi Middle School. I thought, ooh, we always think of Vince Lombardi, but nobody thinks of his middle name. Is there one student, if you raise your hand, I can point you out who can tell me what the T stands for? Nobody? No show of hands. Nobody knows what the T stands for. Any of the uh, well, there's staff? A, there's a hand. There's a hand. We got. Oh, we got a hand. Stand up, please. What does the T in Vincent T Lombardi stand for? I believe it is Thomas. Come on. All right. So, so I did get a confirmation because I was thinking, is it Thomas? Is it Thomas? So we we heard it's Thomas. We don't want to find out later on that it's something else like Theodore. That's great. Well, James, thank you so much for, for coming here. We know this week is a busy week and then we'll get to the, the hot topic, the Super Bowl here before we end today <laughs> for sure. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. Your experiences, uh, sure. you know, the things you experience now being in the media. We'll get to that towards the end of the program. Uh, but to start out those values I mentioned, commitment, integrity, courage, respect, and honesty. Out of those five, do you feel one stands out to you more as, you know, this is kind of the value I strive for? Or all five of them super important. They all kind of work together, kind of like a team. So name them again so we can go over them as slowly so everybody can kind of. All right. So we got commitment. Commitment. Integrity. Integrity. Courage. Courage. Respect. Respect. And honesty. And honesty. And it's funny when you think about the five, they're all closely linked together. But the one that kind of stands out to me is integrity because integrity is what you believe and it's also what I believe other people think of you so they they look at you and they go you know I kind of like that kid I, I like the way you know his hair his clothes or whatever and some of that's linked to your integrity and your individuality so that integrity is something that each and every person has and that you can continue to develop and people can count on you they can depend on you. And I, so I think that integrity for me is maybe the most important of all those categories. And I don't know if it's something that you just have naturally or something that you develop over time. And, and it's cool because all of them do sort of play together. You yeah. know, you can have one, be great in one, but if you lack in the other four, you're still going to suffer not only on the field, but off the field as well. So with that in mind, was there one of those values that you kind of took from your football career? And then we're able to apply to your life after football, life off the field, or things you're currently doing today. Well, and, and so when you talk about a football career, um, I grew up in Los Angeles in the, in the 60s. And for anybody who's watching like Black History Month right now, and you're looking at characters like Martin Luther King, or you're looking at Malcolm X, those, those men were about the same age that you guys are now for me you know, 12, 13, 14 years of age. And so they were on the local news and national news and they were people who were part of society. So when I look at what they were able to do in my life, their, their integrity, their commitment, the respect that they were able to garner 
around the world and around the nation was just incredible. So when I, when I look at my career as a football player, it started when I was 12 years old. And I started to play Pop Warner football because it was something that I enjoyed. But it wasn't something that I said, oh, this is going to be a career for me. It just flowed into it. So sometimes you're doing something that you enjoy, and then that career just shows up in front of you. So for the people who are sitting here in this audience, and we're doing this over video, live streaming it, whatever you want to call it, that's something that didn't exist 10 years ago, that we didn't think of. And even with the pandemic that we had over the last two years, we've created new ways to communicate with people. And you talk about communicating with people around the world, you guys can do that almost every day, just with your tweets and with your Facebooks and with your TikToks All those. and different things like that. So yeah. uh, you mentioned it, you know, February, this is Black History Month. Um, as an African-American athlete growing up and now somebody who works in the media as a broadcaster for all of our viewers today, not only here, but all of our Facebook live viewers and all the students we have connected in. Why is it important to celebrate trailblazers like Marion Motley or Bobby Mitchell, Willie Lanier this month uh, and uh, their impact that they gave to the game of football that paved the way for some of probably our students' favorite athletes today? It, it, it's, it's so great uh, learning about history. I, was, I flew in yesterday and I flew in from California and I'm watching this thing on this Apple TV and it's about Silk Sonic. Bruno Mars and Anderson Pack. And I was just fascinated listening to them talk about musicians that they had listened to when they were younger. So that history permeates everything that we do. You can't really go into the future unless you know where you've come from. And so I think that's the important thing. The, the tongue in cheek joke about Black History Month for anybody who's African-American, you go, why did we get the shortest month of the year? <laughs> so you, you look at that and you go, we should have gotten a longer month. We should have gotten a month when, during the summer or whatever. But learning about your history, learning about people who preceded you is just fascinating. And just like, you know, knowing about Vince, Vincent T. Lombardi, you know, well, knowing what that means and knowing what type of person he was. And Coach Lombardi was the first coach who had his black players and his white players room together. Now you may say that doesn't sound that instrumental. Where well, there used to be a rule in the National Football League called the 246 rule. And what that meant in the 60s is you either had two blacks on your team, four blacks on your team, or six blacks. And you go, well, why was that? Because a lot of coaches thought that they had to put the black players together to room together. And Lombardi was the first one who said, I don't have any black players, I don't have any white players. I have green players. And a lot of people said that the reason that he felt like that is he grew up Italian and he was very dark complected. And so he felt conscious about that and he understood that his black players were just players. And he was one of the first people to step out and do something like that. So you guys are going to a, a school for somebody who was not only a great coach, but also a great vision. We know the impact he had on the field. One yeah. of the greatest coaches to ever, ever game, but it's cool to hear that that impact stands outside the game exactly. and how what he did and the, the namesake of the school we're at today shows that that is continuing to live on. It just doesn't end when a career ends. Speaking of Lombardi, we're going to go to our students right here at Lombardi Middle School for our first question. Now, I know there's some students out there who have some questions. So all I need to do is one student to raise their hand. Who's going to be brave? All right. Right over there. That's whose hand I saw first. All right. Go ahead and step up. We're going to get the mic to you here. State your name and then go ahead and ask your question. Now, now when you when you do ask your question, one of the things that you learn in broadcasting is to speak slower than what you think you would. Take a deep cleansing breath, relax, because there are only millions of people watching you right now. <laughs> no pressure. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, my name is Michaela Walker. I am an eighth grader at Lombardi Middle School. And I would like to ask, what do you think your greatest weakness is? Ooh. Well, we're starting off with a hard one. I, I love <laughs> that because somebody, I often say when I'm broadcasting a game that a, that a player's greatest strength is his greatest weakness. So if a guy's really fast, he's probably a little bit smaller. He's not as strong. If a guy's really big, he's not quick. My greatest weakness. The other thing that I learned, repeat the question, stall for time. My greatest weakness, huh? Um, 
my wife might say that I'm not confrontational. And by that, with, with our kids, with whatever, I'm looking for a soft solution sometimes as opposed to being real confrontational. But I look at that as my strength also. So like I said, a greatest strength can be your greatest weakness if you apply it correctly. Awesome, thank you for that. So now the cool thing is we're gonna to go to all of our students who are tuned in, not virtually, but from all over the country today from uh, schools um, representing the, you know, different parts of the entire country, different grades. So what we're gonna do, our first group we're gonna to go to, we're gonna to go to South Courtright for our next question. So our students there at South Courtright, I'm gonna kind of look up here. So we're, are those students there at South Courtright, go ahead and unmute your microphone, step up to the camera, and then go ahead and ask your question. Uh, my name's Emma Sakari. I'm in the sixth grade at South Courtright Central School. And I would like to ask, who do you feel helped you with your greatest accomplishment? So who do I feel helped me with my greatest accomplishment? That, that is so tough. Um, my dad ended up being a single parent. Um, I had older brothers and sisters who were seven, six, five years older than me. And then I was, quote, the baby. And uh, when I was going into the third grade, we were living in Philadelphia. And my dad had been stationed in Germany. So he stops in, Germ in Philadelphia and he meets with us. He says, well, we're going to move to California. And so he gets on a plane. He goes up to California, finds us a house. My mom puts the four kids on the plane, but she doesn't come with us. So that was the last time I saw my mom. I'm getting ready to go into third grade. The next time I saw her, I was 20 years old. And so my dad all of a sudden becomes dad, mom, everything else. And he was really great about making sure that I did my best. And I know that sounds corny and, and not that big of a deal, but I remember when I went off to college, he would send me like a little short little note, study hard, do the best you can. I meant to put $5 in the envelope, but I had already sealed it up and then he'd send it to me. <laughs> now he couldn't have already sealed it up if he wrote that. <laughs> he was just always pushing me to do the best that I could. So my dad was probably my biggest influence in my life. All right, our next question, we're gonna go out to our school there at Westfield. So our students there at Westfield, go ahead, unmute your microphone, step up, state your name, your grade, and then go ahead and ask your question here for Mr. Lofton. Hi, I'm Lucas Zelensky. Great. Uh, I'm in grade 12 uh, from Westfield Academy and Central School. And I was wondering, what is your greatest experience in your football career that you remember? We got a senior in high school, huh? That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Greatest experience. Um, I played here for nine years from 1978 to 1986. Boy, that sounds like a long time ago. <laughs> then I played two years with the Los Angeles Raiders and that was my hometown. So I got to go back home, but then I went to the Buffalo Bills and I played in Super Bowl 25. So I had played in the league for 13 years and I was finally getting to play in my very first Super Bowl. And that was probably the highlight going to that game and uh, having my family and my friends there and, and just getting to play on the NFL's biggest stage, obviously playing in that Super Bowl 25. Now, you mentioned the Packers, the Raiders, the Bills, probably three of the biggest, greatest, most loud, obnoxious oh, yeah, fan bases yeah. out there playing for those fan bases. You know, you hear all the, the stories about Bills Mafia. You yeah. see people on the frozen tundra. Now, everybody out in Los Angeles or Oakland now or in, Vegas. in Las Vegas. Yeah. Um, what is it? What is it playing in front of fans like that? And how important is it as a player? And do you feel that energy coming from the fans? Uh, you know, now I, I, it, it's funny, for the last 40 plus years, I've been involved with the NFL, either as a player, a coach, or a broadcaster. And so you get to travel around. And every city has, quote, the best fans. What's, what's interesting, though, and I live in San Diego now, and people move to San Diego from other places. When you're from Green Bay, it's probably the first place you've lived in, Buffalo, the first place you might have lived in. And so those fans, their team is so much more important to them than, you know, like a Las Vegas Raiders where you just adopt a team because they just moved down there recently. 
So the, the fan bases are great everywhere around the country. And this one ranks up there, I think, above all the others, believe it or not. That's just not because we're in Green Bay, right? Not, not okay, because we're right, in Green Bay, right. no. no. <laughs> all right. Um, when I started off, you know, I mentioned a lot about what we believe in at the Hall of Fame, our mission, honor the heroes of the game, like Mr. Lofton, who has a, hall, who has a gold jacket, but also everybody who had spent time in the NFL playing as a, as a player, a coach, an administrator, because, you know, the game of football wouldn't be like it is today without their influence. So we have to preserve that history. And one way we preserve that history is in our archive. So we thought, what better way to showcase to all of our students what the Pro Football Hall of Fame is about than go live to our archive. So we're lucky enough to be joined by today by John Kendall, who's the Vice President of Archives, Education, and Football Information in his office, which is pretty cool because it's in our archive. So John's going to talk a little bit about what he does, what we do at the Hall of Fame, and he might have some special artifacts from Mr. Lofton's career uh -oh, to show off uh -oh. as well. So, John, go ahead and do you whenever you're ready. Smell, smell hey, Jake, you. appreciate you sending it down here, James. Always uh, great to be with you. Can't thank you enough for all you've done for the game and all you do for the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, where I'm standing right now is, is my office, which is uh, where we preserve 40 million pages of documents and 6 million photographic images. So what better place to, to come to work every day than being surrounded by the history of the game and not just the game itself, but every player, coach, and contributor who built the game to what it is today. You're talking about uh, close to 30,000 individuals uh, over the uh, 100 plus years of the National Football League that have built the game to what it is today. And so, uh, you know, today I pulled out a few things related to the history of the game that I'd love to share with you because this is an area where most people don't get a chance to come and, and visit. Uh, this is where we build out our exhibits, some of the information, but we have documents here from the Dutch Sternman collection. These are documents from 1925 when the National Football League was just five years old. We've got a game program here. We have a few college football materials, Princeton versus Yale, first ever college football championship game in 1880, which is pretty unique. We got pretty much every book ever written on pro football history, a lot of them as they relate to the early origins of the game. This is a special piece. This is the first ever Chicago Tribune charity football game program that pitted the college all-stars in a given season versus the NFL champion, something you will never see again. There's too much at stake for all parties involved. And that lasted into the Super Bowl era. So 1976, you had the college all-stars playing the Super Bowl champion Pittsburgh Steelers. And I think it would surprise a lot of you to know that the college all-stars actually won nine of those games and tied two. So uh, there, there definitely was a, uh, uh, it, that game was very competitive. We've got media guides. Uh, this is a, a media guide from 1937, uh, the Green Bay Packers. And one of the, the things that, that I think uh, the Packers have always done a great job of is not only with the community, but their, their media and, and getting the information about their team and their players out to the rest of the country. Um, got jerseys here, like, like this one from 2012, J.J. Watt. Um, since 1997, we've received the draft card of every player drafted into the National Football League. So what better way to start a player's personal archive than with their draft card? This is the card they fill out hand to the league saying we're selecting this player and uh tom brady just retired here uh, a few weeks ago this is his draft card six round 199 compensatory selection and now one of the greatest players in nfl history um so it doesn't matter where you start it, it's what you do with your opportunity when you're there james a few things we have from from your collection obviously from archive collection standpoint, huge photo collection, over 6 million photos in our collection. Uh, these are some of, of uh, the photos related to your career. Uh, we also got your helmet here from uh, that you wore through the 1980s. And I think one of the things in, in doing some research about uh, your career, um, you were the first player to score a touchdown in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. And I think your career really to me, highlights exactly what a Pro Football Hall of Famer is. Uh, consistent excellence over a long period of time. And my question for you would be, how did you maintain uh, that standard of excellence for such a, a long career? I, I did hear the question. Um, it was what I enjoyed doing. I really loved the, the kind of the workouts. I mentioned growing up in Los Angeles, when I was 12 years old, the Olympics were on television from Mexico City in 1968. 
And they were the Olympics that I remember with John Carlos and Tommy Smith doing the black power salute on the Olympic stands, right, in 1968. And the reason that those Olympics were important, if we watch the Olympics from last year, they were way across the country. And so you weren't watching them in real time. And, but in Mexico City and California, it's just an hour's time difference. So I was watching these guys for the first time. And it was the first time that I had noticed something like that on television. And I was just sitting up here thinking about all these students in the classroom. By a show of hands, can you guys just raise your hands if you think that you can be part of history? Okay, so for those of you that didn't raise your hands, you guys are a part of history. You went to this middle school, you're gonna to go to such and such high school. At some point, you're also gonna vote in elections. Somebody in this room is gonna run for political office. Th those are just the, the odds. Somebody, just like you guys have student body presidents, that person's gonna say, hey, I kinda of like being on that council, that different things like that. Maybe I'm gonna run for city alderman. Maybe I'm gonna run for mayor or something like that. So don't diminish the possibilities and the, the reach that you can have. Even the guy who's kind of half asleep in the, in, the, in the room here, you don't know how successful he's gonna be and how much fun he's gonna be to be around. He just woke up a little bit too. That's not me, right? No, not okay, you. All right, all right, perfect, perfect. <laughs> Thought I was talking about me. Um, you know, you talk about, you know, leaving a legacy, leaving history, you know, and making a difference. And, you know, folks who play in the, the NFL have a certain platform to do yes. that. And, you know, that platform leads them to do great things on the field, off the field. Um, and then eventually, maybe one day, leading them to the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Um, Thursday, big announcement coming out. Yes. So Thursday, the Pro Football Hall of Fame is going to announce the class of 2022 at the NFL Honor Show Thursday night. So if you're in front of your TV, make sure you tune in. Uh, fellow Green Bay Packer alum, Leroy Butler, who, if you don't know, coined the term, made famous the Lambeau Leap. So we have him to thank for that. Um, he might near his, hear his name called or his, get his door knocked on uh, Thursday to be a member of the class. So as a fellow, a fellow Packer alum, when another Packer gets inducted into the Hall of Fame, not necessarily you know a teammate, but somebody right. else who played for the organization, what do you as a former Packer legend see in that? And do you feel any pride in, in, in an induction like that? Well, it, it's interesting. When, when I came here in 1978, there were a group of Packers who had played for Vince Lombardi who were just NFL royalty. And Bart Starr, who was my coach at the time, but Paul Horning, Willie Davis, Ray Nitsky, these were names just as familiar as Aaron Rodgers, Devontae Adams, um, the current Packers. So I looked at these guys and I thought, look at them. They're, they're just these icons of the game. So to be mentioned in that category with those players is always special, but to just be a player period on any team at any level, um, during the preseason, I get to do the Packers preseason television games. And in the fourth quarter of a preseason game, People are kind of tuning it out and want to go do something else. And I'd say, wait a minute. This is the time when you want to watch because the players that are on the field now, whether or not they make the Packers or the team that they're playing against, they were the best. They were the best high school player ever produced at a certain high school. And so to get to that level, whether you're just there for the preseason or whether you're there for 10 years, is quite the accomplishment. And I, I hope, I, I'm sure the fellow Packer fans here are hoping to, to hear uh... – yeah, Mr. Butler be yep. named a member of the class. All right, we got some more schools. We got some awesome questions for us. So we're going to go out to Mayfair for our next question. So our students there at Mayfair, go ahead and step up to the microphone, state your name, and then go ahead and ask your question here for Mr. Lofton. A <laughs> little bit of feedback. All right, whenever you're ready. My name is Daniel. My name is Daniel. I'm a third grader at Mayfair Elementary School. How can influence Daniel? All right, all right, hold up, hold up. We're getting a little bit of feedback from you guys there. So what we'll do is go ahead and put that in the chat function. Put your question in there, and what we'll do is we'll we'll send it back to the Pro Football Hall of Fame here in a second to make sure we get your question. So go ahead and put that question there in the chat. We're going to move on now to our next school. 
Maple Heights for our next question. So our students there at Maple Heights there with Mr. Green, go ahead and step up to the microphone, state your name, and then go ahead and ask your question. Hello, my name is Kalana Henderson from Maple Heights ECAC. I am a junior. My question is for Michael Lofton. What events happen to you as a child that make you the man that you are today? Thank you. Oh, so, James Lofton, my bad. So what events that I went through as a child yeah, made me the help, man that I am today? It, it, you know what? It was teachers, coaches, friends. Um, it's kind of one of those questions that you say all of the above. Uh, I look back on some of the friends that I had now. One of, one of my best friends is a, and, and I say this all the time, a kid by the name of Kevin Turner. Well, Kevin is now 64 years old, and I still call him a, a kid that I grew up with. But we've been friends since the third grade. We talk on the phone probably two or three times a week. You know, we text each other back and forth. And these friends are people that you're gonna be around. You look around this, this auditorium right here or the classrooms that are involved with us remotely. These are your friends that you're gonna have for the next 20, 30, 40 years. So better be good friends because you're stuck with them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just got word from, from Ken that Mayfair has changed their setup. So we're gonna try and go back to Mayfair now for our next question. So our students there again at Mayfair, let's try that again and let's see if we can get your question here for Mr. Lofton. My name is Galen McDowell. I'm a third grader at Mayfair Elementary School. How important was Jim Brown and the first African-American, Chris Pollard, to the game of football? I missed that. Can you go ahead and repeat that for us a little slower, a little more clear? My name is Galen McDowell. I'm a third grader at Mayfair Elementary School. How important was Jim Brown and the first African American, Fritz Pollard, to the game of football? Gotcha. So, how important Fritz Pollard, all, one of the first modern and era Jim, players, and, and, and Jim, Jim Brown. Brown? Yep. Arguably, a lot of people call so, him the GOAT. So, <laughs> you guys don't know who Jim Brown was. Uh, he was a running back for the Cleveland Browns. And, and I can remember this as if I was 10 years old because I'm sitting on our green plastic sofa with my dad. And we're watching the Cleveland Browns play. And he goes, and they're talking about Jim Brown because he's the leading rusher in the league. He's a tough guy. He went on to do movies and stuff like that. But he goes, Jim Brown, he's no Marion Motley. And I go to myself, I'm thinking, well, Marion Motley, who's Marion Motley? I later find out that Marion Motley was one of the first African-American players to play for the Cleveland Browns. And my dad, who was born in 1915, and at the time it's probably 1965 or whatever, he related to the Cleveland Browns. He grew up in a small town in Texas, but he related to the Cleveland Browns because they became his team. They became his team because they were the only team that had black players. And so he looked at Marion Motley as the standard. And then Jim Brown followed Marion Motley, but so there was that sense of pride, just like you're sitting in this classroom right now or wherever you're sitting, there's somebody that you're looking at and you're going, I like the way that they're doing stuff. We talked about the core values of the Hall of Fame and you see one of those values, the integrity, the, the commitment, the respect that that person has garnered. And you say, that's kind of what I want. Because nobody's setting out to say, oh, I want to flop. We all want to, we all want to pass with, with flying colors. So you're looking at people who are inspirational and Jim Brown, very inspirational, Fritz Pollard, very inspirational. And for my dad, he looked at those Cleveland Browns and they represented something that he saw. Just like when I was coming up, I was the high school quarterback. So I would look at the few high school black quarterbacks who are in the NFL and think, well, maybe, so possibilities. Two great, obviously now fellow teammates with you yeah. uh, in Canton uh, at the Hall of Fame, a team that, that Deacon Jones famously said, can never be cut from, never be traded from. Once you're on it, you are on it for eternity. Yep. So, so very cool. Now, to to look, see, hear a story like that, uh, you know, something that's you know tied personally not only to your your football career but your personal life as well. When you do get inducted or did get inducted to the Hall of Fame, and you got to meet Jim Brown or you got to sit down with idols you grew up, what did that mean to you to kind of connect your football career and your personal life all together? It, it just it, the 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 ability to play in the National Football League the perks that you get from it have just blown me away. 
the being in Los Angeles and tomorrow uh, I'll go up to Los Angeles for some of the Super Bowl events, but to meet celebrities, people that you consider celebrities and you, you look at them and all of a sudden you can't even talk as you're standing there next to them. And somebody like a Denzel Washington or somebody who's on the movies or somebody who's an entertainer, you meet them and you, you're going, uh, you know, I really like, uh, 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 <laughs> and you can't even think about the movie that they're in. And then you walk away from it and you go, can't believe I couldn't talk. So those meetings are, are great. I remember meeting Shaquille O'Neal and couldn't believe how big he was. Knew that he was 7'3", but you, you don't think he's really going to be 7'3 when you meet him in person. And he's about this wide too. So <laughs> meeting somebody like that, meeting actresses and, act and entertainers is just a phenomenal experience and a great perk from wearing a gold jacket and being in the National Football League. So not only is there that shock factor, but uh, talk a little bit about the level of respect. Because obviously, you know, within the game of football, everybody who plays respects, you know, one of our yeah. values, respects those other players. But you get to your level at the Hall of Fame, there's such a high level of respect for what everything is done. Is there a mutual respect between you meet a guy like Shaq who excelled in his sport and at, it was at the top of his career just like you? What is that mutual respect like between, you know, those outside the game and in the game? Well, it, it's interesting when uh, the first time that I had somebody frame what the word respect meant was Bart Starr. Bart Starr was the quarterback of the Green Bay Packers here, was the quarterback for Vince Lombardi, and he was the most valuable player in Super Bowls I and Super Bowls II. So you look at Bart Starr, you transition to Brett Favre, you go on to Aaron Rodgers, great quarterback for the Green Bay Packers. But Bart Starr was our head coach, and we had a meeting room just like this, over at um, what's our uh, St. Norbert's College. And Bart Starr wrote the words respect up on the board. And he said, respect is something that you earn. It's not given away. And Bart Starr said, I he's talking to the team. He says, I have to earn your respect just like I want you to earn my respect. And I just thought it was interesting that here's somebody who's two-time Super Bowl MVP, saying that he had to earn our respect. And really, you do have to earn somebody else's respect. And that's the great thing about football. You play as hard as you can against another opponent. And at the end of the game, you walk over and you shake hands. And it's saying that, hey, I really respect what you did today, whether you beat them 25-24 or whether you beat them 50 to nothing. You can earn that respect on either side of the ball. Very cool. Uh, as we mentioned, not only do we have a bunch of schools connected in who you've seen up on the screen here today or have you seen in our Facebook live stream, but we got some schools who are view only or just watching the program. And we've got some great questions coming from them as well as our Facebook live audience. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to throw it back to Canton, Ohio, to Nathan Martin, a youth and education coordinator who's in our studio, kind of monitoring everything, running the broadcast today. who has got a question from one of our virtual audiences. So Nathan, whenever you're ready, go ahead with the question. Yeah, Jay, thank you so much for sending it back here. And Mr. Lofton, thank you for being a part of the program today. Um, we've got a question from Magnolia School who's watching on Facebook, and they wanted to know, did you ever feel like being an African-American uh, in the 1960s, the 70s, as your career through high school, college, and then the beginning of your NFL career, did you ever feel like being an African-American held you back or you weren't able to play quarterback beyond a certain level? Did you ever experience anything like that? Um, in your career? So did I ever experience any racism, either overtly or subtle? Yes, sir. I went, I went to George Washington High School in Los Angeles, and it is in what is now called South Central Los Angeles, and it's one of the schools in the 70s where a couple of the different well-known gangs started. And so we're playing a game against a school in the Valley, which is an all white school. We were an all black school and we had an altercation during the course of the game. And I had to go out to that school on the Tuesday after we played them and kind of get on the PA and, and not apologize, but kind of talk about what happened and, you know, the names that were being said about us and different things like that. So that was the first time that I had ever had that context because before I was in this cocoon in this bubble where everybody else around me was the same color as me. So I didn't see it and I didn't think that, oh, I can't play quarterback. I can't do this. I can't do that because it, that just wasn't an issue. It was just 
that community that I grew up in. And so when you go to college and you move out into the world, you see the world a little differently. But I still had confidence in my own abilities, but also knew that, you know, it was different. My wife grew up in the South in Arkansas, and believe it or not, when she was walking down the street, she had to step off the sidewalk if a white person was coming from the other direction. So that's, you know, how much things have changed. Mm -hmm. You know, and looking at those moments and, you know, you kind of frame it as persevering through adversity. Yeah. Um, you know, you went through that, obviously, moments throughout your career. There might be students in our audiences today that they have to persevere through their own adversity. What are some tips and tricks for students who might be going through something like like a situation you went through or something in their own lives? And how do they get through it? Well, I don't I don't know if it's if you could say tips or tricks, but we are living in a multiracial society. And all we have to do is look around, even look with, within our own family members. My grandkids are biracial. So what I had to do is you have to then embrace both sides of the family. And if you, if you, if you look around, people's sexual orientations are different now than they've ever been before. So you can't throw a stone down your family tree without crossing a racial boundary or crossing a boundary of how somebody identifies. And so all those roots grow together. And if they grow together, they make a stronger tree. So the ability to accept everyone, to be part of this whole community, I think is vitally important. And that's what football is, it's a team. Guys get mm -hmm. together and they play, regardless of their race, their sexual identity, and they get together and they do things together. And so that's, if you want to make a better society, like Michael Jackson said, look at the world and make a change. Uh, you summed it up there. You know, that it's kind of the, the message that, that we believe so much at the hall is how cool the game of football is. Yep. There's so many things in life that can teach you important values, virtues, life lessons. But the game of football, we think now we're, you know, we're the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So we're obviously <laughs> going to think that football does sure. this. But it brings everybody together, no matter, like you said, no matter where you're from, your last name, what you look like, what you believe in, with one goal. And that's to get the ball in the end zone. Yeah. Um, you know, we, we've already kind of taken a look at the archives, kind of a behind the scenes. And let's just to our audience know that like, everybody who comes and visits the Hall of Fame, they don't get to see that. But what they do get to see when they come to the Hall of Fame is one of those three iconic symbols that you get when you're enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. You see Mr. Lofton here, he's got the Haggard gold jacket on. He's got the K Jeweler Ring of Excellence. And the only thing we're missing is that bronze bus. So what we're going to do is we're going to go live to our Hall of Fame gallery to the Director of Youth and Education. Uh, Jerry Shockey is actually in our Hall of Fame gallery in front of a bronze bus that probably looks a little familiar to you here. So, Jerry, whenever you're ready, take it away. Jake, thank you very much. My good friend, James Lofton. Good to see you, my friend. Uh, I'm, I'm, we're taking care of this for you, okay? So, uh, uh, I just want to let students know just, like, how big of an honor it is to be enshrined in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Just to put things in perspective here, just for a moment, there have been 300 million people to play the game of football at all levels throughout history. There have been 5 million that have played it at the college level. There have been 29,000 that have been paid to play, coach, officiate, or administrate the game of football. There are only 354 members of the Pro Football of Fame, one of those being James Lofton. And then somebody brought up another name, one would be on my other shoulder, Fritz Pollard, who uh, broke the color barrier in 1920. Now, now, James, I have a question for you because, you know, I could go through stats here with you, you know, the career, uh, retirement career yardage leader, uh, touchdown catch in the 70s, 80s, 90s. There's all kinds of things I can share, but I know you personally, and I know the quality of person that you are. When I think of James Lofton, I think of integrity, which you said was probably the one that stands out. I think of honesty. I, I, I know your family. I know Bev. I know your wife. I mean, we're on social media together. I see how you carry yourself, how you act, how you treat people. Out of all these honors and accolades that you have, how do you keep yourself humble? Where, where's the humility come from for you to keep things in proper perspective? You know, it's funny. My wife told me before I came here, you should tell the students that, you know, you have a bus just like that one in our house. And the thing about that bus, that bus has hair and I no longer have hair. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, you talk about being humble and there's a, uh, we, we have a Hall of Fame radio show that I used to do, and I got to interview a lot of the Hall of Famers. 
And one of the questions that I would always ask them, one of my stock questions was, when did you kind of figure out that you were better than Johnny or Billy down the street? And there are some guys who, oh, when I was five years old, I used to race the eight-year-olds and I used to beat them. And then there's the guy who, well, I had an older brother and my older brother beat me up all the way until I was 11 years old. And he was five years older than me. And then that day I beat him up. And so I knew I was bigger and faster than everybody else. And then there are some guys, there's one guy by the name of Don Maynard. And that name doesn't mean anything to you guys. He just, just passed away mm -hmm. recently. Might've been in his early nineties. Don Maynard grew up on a farm down in Texas and didn't start playing football until his senior year. And the reason he didn't play football is because he had to work on the farm. So he had to tend to the animals and do all that kind of stuff. And he started playing. But the reason I mentioned his name is about 15 years ago, we were back in Canton in August, which is where they do the Pro Football Hall of Fame ceremonies. And Don, Hutz, Don Maynard rather was sitting over in the corner. And the young receivers who were in there sticking out their chest, oh, I was better than you or I caught more passes than you did. I grouped them all together and I said, come on guys, I need to take you over here to meet somebody. This is Don Maynard. He was better than you before you were you. <laughs> and so that, that humbleness is just that respect that you have for somebody who did it before you. So that respect can be within this classroom, within the students who are sitting here. The young lady who was the first person to, to stand up and talk and ask a question, there's got to be a level of respect there to get up and ask that question. But you also have to be humble enough to say, yeah, I got to ask the question and, and I'm glad that I did get to do it because everybody else could have done it too. And you got to respect that above amongst your peers. Um, a lot of people know you, you mentioned your time, you went to Stanford and, you know, at Stanford, two sport athlete, track star and a football player. But what a lot of people don't know is you actually played for a hall of fame coach yeah. at Stanford and Bill Walsh and, you know, and doing some research and reading about, you know, Bill Walsh and his standard of performance. When, when a, when a, coach comes in especially a, in college and establishes that quote-unquote standard of performance how did that help you become the best football player in person you could be you guys are being thrown a lot of names that, <laughs> that, that aren't that aren't current for you um bill walsh was a great coach with the san francisco 49ers they won championships my coach before bill walsh was there was a guy by the name of jack christensen jack christensen is also in the pro football hall of fame my track and field coach, I was on the track team also, was a guy by the name of Peyton Jordan. Well, I mentioned the 1968 Olympics that were in Mexico City. That was the greatest track and field team of all time. They won more gold medals. They set more world records. Peyton Jordan was that coach, that uh, Olympic coach for that team. So those coaches that I had, I didn't know they were supposed to be great Hall of Fame coaches. There were guys that I was going... I don't want to run that. That's too much work. He's making it. So they were guys that, you know, you might have bucked a little bit, but in the long run, you look back on it and saying, that's why I was successful. So as you guys are going through middle school, getting ready to go to high school, look back and some of your pre-K teachers, some of your elementary school teachers, they're, they're, they're working to shape you and form you and, and to lift you up. And you have to be able to realize that as you're going through all this, as you're being a little frustrated, as things aren't maybe going exactly the way that you want them to, your teachers are trying to lift you up. They're trying to get the best out of you. And it's funny, you don't always realize that in a relationship that somebody else is pushing you to get a little more from you. You mentioned, like you said, you know, we're mentioning a lot of these names that, that students might not know, but yeah. you've mentioned some Hall of Famers, some very prominent people in the game of football. But looking back on your career, you get drafted into the NFL. You know, you head to Green Bay, this storied franchise. What was your welcome to the NFL moment? When were you like, all right, I'm here. I made it. It's time to go. Um, so I could, I could mention something that happened on the field. But off the field, we had a, a tight end by the name of Rich McGeorge. And Rich McGeorge was this really old, old player on our team. So when I get here to Green Bay, I'm 21 years old. And Rich McGeorge was really old. He was 28. And he, I thought he was ancient. And so we were down in De Pere, right over near St. Norbert's College. 
and we were gathered together and he had kind of pulled all the rookies together since he was the old, old player on the team. And he made this comment. He said, every player who plays becomes an ex-player. I haven't been in Green Bay for two weeks. And here's somebody saying, every player who plays becomes an ex-player. And that has stood in my mind for the last 40 plus years because you're not granted you know, forever in the National Football League. You have a little small window. You take advantage of it. You make the most of it. You enjoy it as much as you can. And you may be bored as heck being in eighth grade, but really enjoy it as much as you can. Enjoy it as much as you can. Make the most of it. Make the, make the most of your friendships. Extend yourself a little bit. Go talk to somebody or sit with somebody that you didn't know real well. Share with them a little bit. These can be lifelong friendships. Now, as promised, you know, we like we said, we mentioned a lot of the older players. Well, we're going to jump to what what's coming up here on Sunday, Super okay. Bowl Fifty Six, and is you know right around the corner. And as much as me, and I'm sure you a, a little bit. I know you have this staying unbiased, but I know a lot of people in this room today. <laughs> as much as we wish that the Packers were playing in this yes. game, yes, we do. Uh, they are not. Um, but what should uh, just a couple things for all the folks who are here going to watch the game? What should we be looking out for on Sunday? Well, the halftime with Snoop Dogg. I mean, I mean that's, uh, the, the Super Bowl is, is more than just a game. It's the, the, the pinnacle of the NFL season. So if you take a huge mountain, you're trying to climb up one of those mountains. If you're watching something on Nat Geo about people hiking up a mountain and not being able to breathe when you get above 20,000 feet, that's what, like trying to get to the top of the mountain in the Super Bowl is like, it's, it's rare air. So the players who are going to get to play in it for the first time or for the second time or the third time, it's special. And they, they should realize how special it is. And for those watching at home, just enjoy the game. And maybe, maybe there's going to be somebody that you know who might be associated with that game. And when I say associated with it, Think of all the production people that it takes to put on a game like this. You know, we're talking to somebody back in Canton, and I know that just from a television perspective, there are thousands of people who are associated with the broadcast of the game. When you look at the, the vendors who are going to be at the stadium, there are thousands of people there in all the events that take place. So if you imagine yourself one day doing something special in entertainment, trust me, you could. You could do it. You could do whatever your mind can kind of imagine. Now, being in broadcasting, you know, you know, talking games, you mentioned your work with the Packers and everything you do with CBS throughout the NFL season. For those of you that don't know, there's a lot of research that goes into sure. to prepping for these games. So you just don't, you know, show up on Sunday and just put the mic on and go. There's a lot of research that goes into that. So throughout the, the season, um, can you name or just kind of go over maybe one thing that helped propel the Rams and the Bengals to this game? Um, there is something about each one of these teams that, that is unique, uh, with the Cincinnati Bengals, their young quarterback, Joe Burrow is just in his second season playing in the national football league. But what he does really well is he believes in himself. He believes that he can make it happen. He was from a small town in Ohio, probably much smaller than green Bay. He went to Ohio State, which was probably his dream school to go to. He said, I'm going to go to Ohio State. I'm going to be a great quarterback at Ohio State. Was he a great quarterback at Ohio State? No. He had to transfer. He went to LSU, turned in some greatness there. So a great turnaround story there. Somebody who dreamed of going to Ohio State, his hometown. Now he's at LSU, wins the national championship. Now he's the, the quarterback of the Cincinnati Bengals. Matthew Stafford. Uh, a little bit of a personal story. My oldest son, David, is 38 years old, and we were living in Dallas, Texas. And my oldest son was a high school quarterback. So we're getting ready to go down at Plano West, and we have a scrimmage game against Highland Park High School. So I've got my chest puffed out because my quarterback is my, high, my son is the quarterback of the Plano West Wolves, and he's one of the top rated players in the state of Texas. But in a scrimmage game, you don't score a touchdown at six points. It's just one point. 
So instead of the score at the end of the game being 18 to 12 or whatever, Highland Park beat us like 10 to 7 because they set it up where each team can score. And I said, well, who was the quarterback for the uh, Highland Park team? They said, oh, that's a little freshman, Matt Stafford. Matthew Stafford is now the quarterback of the Los Angeles Rams. But he spent the previous 10 seasons being the quarterback of the Detroit Lions. And you guys know as Green Bay Packer fans that the Detroit Lions are a team that you play and get to beat twice a year. So Matthew Stafford spent all these seasons being a downtrodden quarterback for the Detroit Lions. But now he's getting a chance to play in the Super Bowl. So it's a little bit of redemption for him, redemption for Joe Burrow, because it's not always a straight line to success. Up, down, curving, back and forth. You just got to be able to navigate it and not quit. So now you got to play in a few Super Bowls as well. If you could have, say, three. this room, three Super Bowls. That's, <laughs> no, that's more than a few. So you had the opportunity right now to have the entire rosters of the Rams and the Bengals in this room. Being somebody who played in the Super Bowl, what would be your one piece of advice for them going into the game? Oof. Um, it, it's crazy. When, when I get a chance to go around and broadcast games, we, we go in. I fly in on Thursday night. And we go to the home team's practice on Friday. And sometimes we are this close to the practice field. When you go to New England, which is where Bill Belichick has his team, they're way across the street. They put you up in stands. You got to have binoculars to look at the players. But some teams will even let me talk to the team afterwards. And so I'm always kind of know that these Guys are just finishing up practice. They want to get in. They want to shower. They want to get off to lunch. They want to do this. And I try and think, what's the one thing that I can tell them? What's the one thing that they may carry on with them? And I tell them, play one play at a time. And they, and they kind of go pause for a second. I say, one play at a time. Because you can't play three plays at a time, can you? You can only play one play at a time. And do the best you can. Not that you erase it after you're finished with it because you realize that you kind of build off of that, but give your best effort each and every day. So that one play at a time, that's what you're trying to do in the course of a game. And that's what you're trying to do in the course of your life. One day at a time, do the best that you can. Awesome. And now, now, now I know you're doing work for Westwood and CBS as we get to the Super Bowl here. So if you have a prediction that you're going to be putting out later, I don't want to spoil it right now, but what are we, what, uh, What's the, what's the outcome going to be on Sunday? So one of the things that I'm very adept at as a broadcaster is, is straddling the fence. And so when you straddle the fence, you don't fall on either side or the other. So as he asked me the question about the Cincinnati Bengals or the Los Angeles Rams, what I do is I start talking about something else that doesn't have anything to do with the question <laughs> that he asked me about. And I just tell him later on, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Thank you. See, very well done. Pro, for sure, right there. <laughs> Um, last question here today, um, and then we'll, we'll, we'll wrap everything up. So much great advice. You know, not but only I throughout would say your career. go, Pat, go, if I were saying anything. All right, that's right. That's, that's good to hear. All right. Um, you know, one piece of advice, you know, there's been so much we, we've looked at throughout the day and, and learned from you as far as in your career, outside of your career. But for all of our students here today, myself included, our staff at the hall and all of our people watching online, if you could leave them with one piece of advice, one thing that they had to remember today, What's that one piece of advice? I would say that middle school, just by the, the term of it, is you guys are in the middle. It's not the middle of the school, but you're kind of in the middle of you're straddling that between adolescence and in about two or three years, you're going to be counted as an adult. And you've got to start doing adult things. So, you know, kind of start preparing yourself getting ready for those things and the things that you're going to learn in middle school, the foundations that these teachers are trying to work with you on, the coaches are trying to work with you on, that's going to be the rock that you're going to stand on later. And the decisions that you're going to make may harken back to when you're in middle school. I remember going to Henry Clay junior high school, junior high school was seventh grade through ninth grade. We didn't have a middle school, but there were things that I learned there and things that still I think about now. So, don't forget what you're doing now because it's going to shape your future. All right. With that, we're going to wrap up this latest installment of the Pro Football Hall of Fame's part of a Hall of Famer series connected by Extreme Networks today featuring our special guest, 
class of 2003 in Shiny in the Pro Football Hall of Fame, Mr. James Lofton. Let's give Mr. Lofton one big round of applause. So again, uh, James, thank you so much for, for making the trip here today. Thank you for giving us uh, a lot of your very valuable time as we lead into Super Bowl back out uh, in LA. Um, thank you for everything you've done for the game of football. Truly, thank you for everything you've done for us at the Hall of Fame. Thank you, students. Give yourself a round of applause. Thank you. Thanks for coming out, guys. I really appreciate you. For everybody who watched online, thank you so much. And we hope to have you connected next time for our Heart of a Hall of Famer series connected by Stream Network. Bye, everybody. Thank you.